Welcome to another episode of Back and Brew, where we talk all things spine over a brew of the guest's choice. Today, our guest is Dr. Doug Crowther, orthopedic spine surgeon in Colorado Springs, who is one of the leading spine surgeons in utilizing robotics in his spine surgeries. I am so excited to sit down and talk with him. This is Back and Brew. Dr. Crowther, thanks for coming on, coming up from Colorado Springs. Um, love to have you here on, on Back and Brew. Uh, tell us about what we brought on here. Yeah, so this is uh, Tommy Knocker's Brewery. Uh, this is Root Beer, um, but they are a local brewery in Idaho Springs, Colorado. Um, brewery that was started back in the mid-1800s during the gold rush, and uh, my little uh, bit of knowledge, um, you know, just the influx of miners and people. And so this brewery was started and obviously they, you know, they have brews, but uh, root beer's kind of my drink of choice here. And um, it's got a very distinct flavor. Go ahead and try yeah. it. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. It tastes different than most root beers. Um, yeah, it is a little different. Um, looking at the ingredients, I think um, Maple, it's got some maple syrup and a maple extract. So uh, there's a little hint of maple. Yeah, in there. yeah, it's really good. Like it's 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 actually really really good. Um, I always drive by it whenever like I'm coming back from the mountain skiing or anything like that. We'll see the Tommy Knocker Brewery. I've even stopped and had some of the food at the pub. Awesome pub, um, and I've had a few of their beers too. It, it's cool that they have. I love that there's a lot of breweries that put out. Yeah, they have all their beers, but then they'll put out like these craft brew beers. You know, my kids obviously love sugary drinks. And um, I, I do too after a long day of uh, skiing, but it was, it was, yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's really good. And it's cool too that it's something that's been around in Colorado longer than most things, right? Like there's not too many. Colorado, I think it was what, is it, what was it like, uh, what was it established? Like 17, I should 18, know this. I don't uh, even yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I have no it's a idea. good thing to look up. Yeah. I, sh I should know my was Colorado it 1876? It might have been 1876. That sounds familiar because I think Centennial State. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Evan, do you have any idea of when? Uh, August first, eighteen seventy six. So this predated Colorado, Colorado. which is nice. crazy. So it was like yeah. around before that. So I knew it was. It only got like incorporated or whatever officially made a company in like the early nineties. Okay. So yeah. I mean, Idaho Springs is for those that don't know, tiny little town on I seventy. Uh, kind of a pit stop in between us and the ski resorts. So uh, it's a pretty, pretty neat place. Growing up here, it's kind of interesting. And, and you're local too, you're native. Do you, like I remember those these really small towns that are in between you know, Denver and the ski resorts as being these kind of trailer parks in the middle of the mountains. And now it's like, oh, you want that little like two bedroom, one bath condo, 900 grand. Right. Like it's, it, it's insane. I mean, I get it, it's Colorado. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you're originally from Colorado. You're an orthopedic spine surgeon. Tell me a little bit about your journey from Colorado into your training and then back to Colorado because it's pretty hard to get back to Colorado yeah. for a lot of people. Yeah, so a little unique, um, interesting fact about me. I grew up in a very small town in southern Colorado called Sanford, a population 800, and I grew up on a dairy farm. And so through high school, I had actually no desire for college, higher education at all. I was just going to stick around the dairy farm. And uh, my dad, very wise individual, said, that's fine. You can take over the dairy, but um, you need a college degree, something to fall back on. I think that was his regret. And so uh, I went off to school. I was initially going, my major when I started was uh, going to be dairy science. Um, and, uh, I never really got into that major cause my freshman year of college, I was like, ah, I don't know if I really want to go back to the farm at this point. Thinking back on my childhood, you know, cows have to be milked and fed every day. So there's like no days off. So we didn't go on a lot of vacations, didn't get away. And I'm like, ah, I, I love the lifestyle, but I don't love that part of it. And so... <laughs> Um, I didn't know what to do. I was interested in finance. I just felt that was too broad. Okay, get a finance degree, and then what? Like, and so um, my brother was uh, getting into medicine. He's a nurse anesthetist, and he's like, what about medicine? I said, there's no way. I 
every time I get blood drawn, get an injection, I pass out. Like I fainted all growing up with these things. He's like, oh, you'll get over it. So I took anatomy. I was like, if I can get through anatomy, I think I can, you know, go into medicine. So I took anatomy, didn't pass out. I'm like, all right, medicine it is. And so, uh, you know, applied to med school, uh, got in. Um, again, I was still worried. Am I going to pass out, faint, these things during clinicals and things like that? And uh, I did okay. I had a few scary moments here and there throughout training. And... Um, my dad had his knees replaced, so I thought that was awesome. And, and naturally, I grew up playing sports, and so I think you kind of gravitate towards orthopedics, kind of being that jock specialty. Um, so I got into orthopedics uh, after med school. Med school was in Las Vegas, and then I did my residency in Kansas City, Missouri. And um, it was there that I really that spine even became, you know, an idea or an option. Prior to that, it was, you know, joint replacement. That was what I thought I was going to do. But um, my first exposure to spine was really um, at a children's hospital in Kansas City doing, you know, bigger deformity, scoly cases. Um, And I just liked the complexity of it. It was just different than this routine bread and butter, very monotonous knee replacement um, surgery that I was used to. So that was my initial, um, gravitation towards it. And then, um, you know, got some adult spine experience in, in residency and was like, you know, I really like this. I could see myself doing this for me and what I've found doing spine compared to some of the other subspecialties within orthopedics. It's very, uh, mentally stimulating. Um, it's not black and white, Hey, this patient needs a knee or hip replacement. It's it's very much detective work in identifying a patient's symptoms, uh, trying to correlate that with imaging, and then the very unique part about spine surgery compared to other surgeries is there's so many different ways to approach pathology. You know, you can do an anterior, a lateral, posterior, and so you can tailor you know, a surgical plan based on the patient's needs, based on, you know, your preferences as a surgeon. And so the whole process from seeing patients in clinic, coming up with a treatment plan, surgical plan, and then the surgery itself is just very mentally stimulating is I think the best way to put it, that it just continues to challenge you and thought provoking throughout day to day. And it doesn't get, you know, monotonous and mundane. So it's funny because I hear like there, there are, we, we see dozens of surgeons in any given month, right? And, and I'll hear some that maybe, maybe wish they might have gone into something different because of the variability <laughs> that spine surgery is, right? Even some of the, uh, like my uncle's an orthopedic, uh, orthopedic surgeon, great like hip knee guy, awesome guy. But he's like, man, honestly, the most wearing thing, even in orthopedics, he's like, is you know, the variability of outcomes sometimes. And again, the variability in a total knee or total hip is not as, is nothing compared to the variability in a spine outcome, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, he was telling me, he's like, yeah, the variability just, it's, it's crazy. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, man, the spine guys, <laughs> they're, they're, they must be gluttons for punishment then with the, uh, the variability that they have. Um, what, what was, so how, what was like, let's kind of go back, the shock of going from, it's not even Alamosa, it's a suburb of Alamosa, which, how many people were in the town you grew up in? Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, it's less than 1,000. I think the sign says 750 population. <laughs> okay, so a family reunion would drastically sway <laughs> the sure. population at that point. Yeah. So what was the, what was the, the culture shock, um, e- even like the perspective shock of going from that to uh, college, then to medical school in Las Vegas? Like, that had to be something of like, could you have, do you really think you would have known what you wanted to do had you not left? Uh, Certainly no. Um, You know, the the initial shock for me, one thing I left out, I served a Mormon mission, uh, LDS mission in Brazil. And so I left um, Sanford population 750 and I went to their training center in Sao Paulo, which is 30 million, right? Jeez. So, you know, I go to this place where 
from from the building as far as you could see was skyscrapers you know <laughs> and so um for me that was a, a amazing life experience you know where you can just you go from high school and you get life experience right um day to day just interaction with people and so for me yeah i i definitely needed to leave small town colorado for as great as it is to really realize um what i want to do what i can do my potential um you know so that's obviously one piece of advice is just you know broaden your horizons you know you can always go back um and there's great things there that i could go back to but um you know there's great things that i've gone on to do and um obviously kind of my roots are there and family's there and so it's part of my upbringing it, it's interesting because it always seems like that the most growth comes out of kind of uncomfortable situations for better or worse like that seems to be the kind of cultivating factor i'm i'm sure going again going from Alamosa to a city that's bigger than New York, it wasn't just like, oh, this is awesome. Like, like there's so much stuff to do. It had to have been somewhat uncomfortable too. For sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, I can, I can kind of look back, not only that, but um, training, you know, you got to put yourself kind of in uncomfortable positions to grow even the first years in practice, you know, I'm three and a half years into practice and I wish I could say it was all roses and butterflies, but you know, there's been a lot of um, uncomfortable situations and challenges and, but you know, you can get angry and frustrated or you can just like be open and look at those opportunities to grow and get better and do better. Absolutely, so we see, uh Denver is a very competitive market. Denver Metro, so I'm talking about Colorado Springs, anything on the front range is extremely competitive. There is a overabundance of spine surgeons, I'm sure as you've, you've come to kind of realize. Um, statistically speaking, about 70% of spine surgeons that start a practice in Denver will fail and have to leave the state within their first two years. Seems like a crazy number. If you go back, you'll actually see it. it in the last 10 years, it's a little bit higher than that. Wow. Um, what like you have a successful private practice. What is your advice to someone who's new starting a private spine practice in a competitive market like Denver or Colorado Springs? Yeah, it's a good question. Those are uh, pretty <laughs> staggering stats. Um, I made it past two years, so hopefully, you know, I don't know what the stat is for five years, but hopefully I'll make it. Um, yeah, I would say to answer that, there's a couple things. You know, obviously good patient care. Um, just like being someone that is willing to sit down and talk with patients and educate them. It's interesting how many patients I see that come for a second opinion and just say, yeah, the surgeon walked in, told me I need surgery, walked out, like never educated the patient. And, and patients just want to be understood and be educated. Um, so I think that's huge because if, if, you know, we have marketing, right? But I, word of mouth, you can't beat it, right? So treating patients right and having good outcomes um, is probably the biggest thing. Um, I have a very supportive practice uh, partners, you know, I'm in a orthopedic group. So I'm, I'm insulated in that regard. Uh, but it was a big task to shoulder because uh, the practice I joined never had spine previously and I was the first spine surgeon right out of training so um, you know it was it was tough and it's been tough um, but I would say just taking care of patients doing good work doing the right thing uh, especially early on just you know treating pathology and not just operating to operate um, those are those are big things and that seems like that would be hard to do for a lot of surgeons that come out because it's like, I have this mountain of debt for yeah. most of them. And I have this group that, especially in your situation, if I have a group of, you know, a bunch of other orthopedic surgeons that are not spine surgeons, they see the spine surgeon they're like, oh, that's, that's, that could be, those could be really valuable cases. So intrinsically, there could be some pressure there, or even if it's not on purpose, there's, there's some pressure to, to operate. And we see that where even down south, you'll see there's some surgeons that will operate on everyone. Mm -hmm. And right away, the first the first button to push is 
is let's book you for surgery. Yeah, I think um, uh, what you touched on, kind of that potential financial motivation. Um, yeah, I mean, it's there, right? Especially med school debt, uh, family, uh, new city, new house, whatever it may be, right? Um, for me, and it, joining a private practice, you know, I didn't have this huge guarantee, right? It, essentially, it's eat what you kill from day one. Um, so I had to just constantly remind myself, I'm in this for the long game, right? I, I'm not looking to go from fellow making 60000 a year to guaranteed, you know, whatever, $100,000 a year. It's like, I'm in this for the long game. Um, do the right thing, build a reputation, and then everything will fall into place. So you you got hired almost right after COVID. During COVID. It was uh, August of 2020 when I started. Oh, geez. All yeah. right. Yeah. So how was, how was that coming from training to starting a private practice, spine practice in a competitive market during COVID? Yeah, I think um, I, I think I had blinders on to not like realize how risky of a situation that was, but it was like, here's my chance in Colorado, take it, make it work. Um, you know, I, I feel like I lucked out um, in fellowship. There obviously was a little slowdown with COVID, um, but you know we were at an academic center, UAB in Birmingham, so a lot of trauma. So we were still busy with trauma stuff. Um, Transition to Colorado. Fortunately, they had started opening back up. There was a little bit of a pickup. And really, there was only about a December of 2020. And then the following year, fall of 2021, um, there was about two months there um, where they limited us or cut us back a little bit. So, yeah, I was affected, but I think I lucked out a little bit that, um, you know, wasn't some of the major, major metro areas that really took oh, a hit. Completely shut down. I had, yeah. I knew I had some, uh, there's some surgeons I know that are in like Buffalo, New York and uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And it was just ghost town, like, like no surgeries, yeah. no one's doing anything. And we were pretty lucky here in Colorado because they would more or less accommodate people so they could still get their health care. I, I yeah. felt like anyway. Yeah. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit about, so it's really interesting that you made the transition that what really got you interested in spine was complex pediatric cases. I would, like, after having kids, I can't even watch a movie that has something to do with kids because I'm like, ah, dude, that's just like, it, it's too much for me. Like, I always want to ask the people that did any kind of pediatric work, like, how do you, how do you separate that? Because you have, how many kids do you have? Five kids. Yeah. Yeah. How do you separate that in, like, does it take a toll would it stop you from going into that long term or? Yeah, I think, I mean, maybe that's one of the reasons I didn't, you know, event, you know, go all the way into Pete's uh, spine. Um, but for me, I guess, um, you know, luckily I was in training, so not as much like day to day interaction as my attendings would have, you know, you were just the technician. They were like, yeah. get in there. You're <laughs> For the most part, you know, so that was just like my initial exposure, but it would certainly, um, that would be hard, very hard. Um, I'm fortunate enough that, you know, I do adult DJ and spine is, is basically my practice. Um, so I've luckily don't have to deal with that, but that would definitely be challenging. So a lot of people don't know what robotic spine surgery is just like, summarize what robotic spine surgery is. Sure. Yeah, I, I would say um, you have traditional navigation, um, you know, where we pre-plan, we utilize navigation on the spine to place pedicle screws. Robotics takes that one step further with a robotic arm. Um, you know, robotics does get some pushback from people and people knock it and say, uh, you know, it's a static drill guide. Okay. Yeah, it's a robotic arm that gives you a, a static position to work through, but it makes it that much easier. I mean, I don't have to hold a position. So it's navigation with a robotic arm. It holds your trajectory so that you can safely and accurately, precisely place pedicle screws in the spine. Um, so moving forward and looking into your, into your, because I've been fortunate enough to sit in on, on a, a handful of your cases, um, robotics. Uh, I, I sat down with 
some of the Globus guys that run just the robot division. And they're like, yeah, Doug Crowther is one of our heaviest users of the Globot. And um, it's the robot made by Globus, the Excelsior. They said that you are have one of the most successful sites of implementing a Globot um, and that it's almost entirely driven by the surgeon um, and how much they commit to what they do with it and uh, really kind of have to almost push the staff to get on board to adopt something new. How has that journey been going into robotics? Yeah, so when I showed up in Colorado Springs, it was, uh, I said, hey, what technology do we have at the hospital? And they said, we have a CR. I'm like, all right. Fortunately, my training, we, we used a little bit of navigation, saw a little bit of robotics, but 90% of our cases was open, freehand technique. So um, I knew it was, technology that I wanted for multiple facets. I wanted it from a marketing standpoint. I wanted it from a efficiency standpoint, from a um, patient safety standpoint, and then just for my um, making surgery that much easier. So like user friendly surgery, um, I, I wanted that. And so, um, you know, I pushed the hospital, hey, we got to get something. Um, Hey, they you know they wanted me to. There's stealth. There's navigation. I said, there's robotics. Like let's let's take this one step further. Navigation's been around for 20 plus years, right? So for me, um, you know, I, I evaluated the robots that were out there, and I felt like the the Globot was was the one. And so um, yeah, it was uh, it was work to get the. The, the program started and, and off the ground. But once you kind of get through those first 25 cases, kind of get the kinks worked out, any glitches, um, it's just it just makes my job, part of my job, that much easier, right? There's an exposure. There's putting in screws. There's doing a decompression, doing inner body work, right? And so if there's one less thing that I have to really – you know, use a lot of mental energy on, it makes the whole surgery that much easier. Where, where do you like, what are you excited about that it's going to go? Like, where do you see robotics going? Yeah, that's a, that's a very um, interesting question. You know, it, it, it made a big leap into, okay, we're really good at placing pedicle screws with the robot. Um, really good at targeting for disc work. Um, endoscopic, you know, uh, you know, targeting an actual disc herniation. I could see that being a, a highly utilized area. Um, you know, maybe at some point it's going to advance to the point like the Da Vinci robot, right? Where, you know, maybe we're doing our decompressions with actual instruments with a kerosene or pituitary rongeur where maybe we're over in the corner and you know, you got a robot docked on the patient doing a decompression. I mean, um, general surgery uses it in fine, delicate surgery. Um, maybe, maybe it's going to go there. Yeah, and I, I really got to commend you on it because you sat through, like, the learning curves, the bugs. Um, there's a lot in implementing a robotic, robotics program, not to mention just getting it approved and getting the hospital to buy it. I mean, that thing is... 1.35 million, something like that, plus a service contract or service yeah. agreement that's, you know, a six figure a year service contract. Um, like to make to make that lift, especially in today's climate with larger and larger GPOs gobbling up hospitals. Have you noticed getting things on contract, even if it doesn't cost more, is harder than um, I would say it needs to be? Certainly. And there's, you know, there's kind of two parts to that. There's the technology aspect. Um, and then there's the whole implant implant aspect with GPOs, right? So from the technology aspect, it was, you know, I kind of went to the hospital and said, look, these other hospitals have at least navigation and robotics, like, let's kind of get with the standard, we don't even have that. Um, so it was a little bit easier. I mean, it was a challenge. It was probably nine month process to, you know, bring it up, go through all the hoops and, and get a robot to show up. Um, but, but for me, like, you know, it was 
proving to them that it would, you know, they want to see, hey, how is this going to make you better, make you more efficient, do more surgeries in our hospital? That was the ultimate question, right? Money. Yeah. <laughs> For them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's the technology aspect. Um, so you got to make a good case and an argument, which was easy. The implant side um, and GPOs, that that is the frustrating side of, of things. Um, I do a lot of surgeries at, at a Common Spirit Hospital, and they went through a GPO, what, 18 months ago, I think. And uh, it was frustrating because, you know, I was a newer surgeon, so I really didn't get much of a voice, even though, you know, my volume was probably, at least in Colorado Springs, towards the top. Um, but I really didn't get a voice. And then they come back and say, hey, these are the 10 companies you got to use uh, for 90% of our spend. And, you know, here's some other companies for 10% of our spend, right? And it's like, hey, I didn't get a say in this. And now you're kind of telling me what implant or, you know, specific technologies from implant companies that I have to use. And that's the hard part um, because... You know, there's certain things that I feel like uh, for my patients would be preferred um, or better that they just said it's not available anymore. So frustrating, um, you know, two-year contract. Hopefully when that time comes around that, you know, maybe I can have a voice and uh, be influential in that because, um, you know, I, it's very hard when hospital administrators or even you know, uh, bean counters are telling the surgeons, hey, you got to use this. Which it's interesting. And just to clarify, GPO, Group Purchasing Organization, uh, for anyone that doesn't know that, it, all it is is it's basically uh, a group of hospitals that band together and they commit to using, um, you know, or they, they commit to having their contracts written as a group with individual manufacturers so they get a better price. So that's kind of what runs most of the hospitals. They're all together under a GPO so they can get lower pricing. Um, but is what's concerning about the whole thing is exactly what you said, is that someone who is not clinical, someone who has possibly never been in the OR, is telling you what you can use for your patients, irregardless of what your opinion or clinical training is on that specifically. Yeah. Yeah, that's frustrating. I mean, I get it. You know, they have PhDs. They have researchers that, that you know, look at data. Um, but, and I get it, they have some collaborative teams, but it's very hard when you're not on that team, right? And then you just get handed marching orders. And so, well, it's even kind of, you even see that even over into like, when you have to do peer to peers, we've had surgeons that did peer to peers, and they wanted to do uh, was one that we just heard about where they uh, wanted to do an anterior posterior, right? So wanted to do uh, two stage surgery. So one in the anterior, and then go posterior and instrument uh, a couple days later. Got denied for two for stage two or uh, the second stage, and the the uh, peer to peer doctor they had to meet with started selling them on stem cells. They're oh, like, wow. "Well, uh, you know, here's what you can do: just do the anterior. I use this great product called Vivigen, and if you use that, you most likely won't have to do the posterior." And the surgeon they were telling this to has been doing this for decades, and he's used he knows almost all these products. And he was just kind of sitting there astounded that the person that was authorizing or denying the surgery was somehow incentivized to try to sell something to them that, from a clinical standpoint, it's kind of the verdict's out on. Sure. The biologics part is pretty gray. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, but we've heard that multiple times. Um, and to look that and to see that every day off in the hospital, I mean, constantly as a spine rep, we look at whenever someone asks, well, a lot of times the manufacturers will come to the distributor like what we are and they'll say, hey, would you would you sell our stuff? And big questions we ask, what contracts are you on? And um, uh, uh, oh, how available are your products? Um, and the contracting pieces, it can be a real nightmare. Um, even if a surgeon legitimately wants it, there there have been times where they will the, the hospitals will push a surgeon to use stuff off label as opposed to approving something on label that is even cheaper than what they're using off label. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, even with this most recent GPO, there was, uh, um, a biologic I factor that I used a lot and, um, you know, they had some arguments as far as 
pricing and certain things. And so then they ended up just being like, oh, nope, we're not utilizing it. Um, why don't you use Enfuse, which is more expensive, higher risk profile. And it's like, what do you not see here? Here's something that is equally as effective, you know, FDA approval. Safer in the spot, in the cervical spine. Safer. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's just kind of baffling that some of the decisions that are made, clinical decisions that are made, marching orders that are given to surgeons. And it's like, well, these are our patients. You know, we have to live with these outcomes and see these patients, but you're telling us how to do it. Yeah, no, a absolutely. And is what's, what's on, on the other end of that are some of these smaller companies that really have come out with some really cool stuff. Very you innovative. Know? Yeah. When, when I first got into spine in 2015, there were really four, maybe five big companies. They kind of ruled the market. Like, yeah. you don't really go outside that. Now, what is your perspective on some of the smaller companies? Yeah, I mean, and, and that was the frustrating part with the GPO is the smaller companies that are innovative, that have newer technologies, um, those are the ones that are get left off, right? And so then you have the big five, the big six. Um, well, as they merge, that number gets smaller, right? Um, we'll say the big five that really haven't done anything majorly innovative. Um, and so you kind of get stuck using traditional stuff and not being able to utilize something that may be better, less invasive, um, quicker fusion for patients. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, you even see it kind of over in like Europe and places like that where it's all state run, where the healthcare system is, where they're like, hey, you can use this one thing or we won't pay for you know artificial disc replacement in some places, for example. Right. Um, that if I were you know, as a young 37 year old father of four, if I ever had to get, hopefully, you know, any kind of cervical pathology, I would hope I'd be a candidate for a, a cervical arthroplasty to maintain motion. But I know that if I were in, you know, the UK or possibly even a lot of parts of Canada, I, I probably wouldn't be able to get one. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's, inter it's interesting to see where healthcare yes. is, is, is actually going. Yeah, that's true. You know, back to your, your uh, other surgeons with peer-to-peers this past week, I had very similar interaction um, with, uh, you know, another spine surgeon on the phone on the other end, but like he has to go by the insurance guidelines. And even though I say, you know, here is NASA's recommendation, um, they're like, well, that's not our guidelines. That's not our, and I'm like. So uh, NAS being the North American Society of Spine Surgeons, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the leading body of, of clinical work, um, publications, and study, ultimately, on all pathology spine. Yeah. What they recommend <laughs> is being trumped by what? An insurance. The their, insurance. their guidelines. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so all right. right. Well, all right, I'm handcuffed. You make my clinical decisions. Great. Man, well, it's not all doom and gloom. What are some things that you're excited about in the future of spine um, that are either uh, procedures, products, or uh, innovations that are that are coming out that you're starting to utilize? Yeah, um, you know, obviously, motion preservation is a big hot topic, and um, you know, rightfully so. Um, you know, when I talk to my partners and and uh, talk about the practice of spine, I say, despite me operating on a spine, it continues to degenerate, continues to, you know, get worse, right? It's not like a knee or a hip where they just go replace it and boom, they're better, right? Um, so, you know, I think advancements in motion preservation um, to try and preserve the spine, preserve function of the spine and, and minimize the... I guess, butterfly effect of traditional spine surgery. Um, so looking, excited to see where that goes. Um, I think motion preservation plays a big role in that. Um, healthcare in general, you know, um, I think the continual evolution of advancements in technology, treatments um, is, is interesting. I look for... One, one thing, me personally, like, you know, we talked about where I was, a dairy farm, I'm in healthcare. Um, 
you know, healthcare sometimes gets a bad rap of, uh, you know, being, being a doctor's too hard and big, you know, big amount of debt to get into medicine. But, you know, I, I, I'm happy where I'm at. Right. So I look forward to my future in healthcare as a profession. Like, yes, there's downside to it, dealing with insurances, dealing with GPOs, but me personally, it's very, um, I have a high satisfaction rate of what I do day to day. And so just continuing to do that, um, I look forward to doing that every day. And, and that's what's awesome. Like I, I've always, you know, I've had a lot of interactions with you and with Tyler, your rep over the last uh, year or so. And like, no matter what's going on, no matter what cases get shifted around, you generally are one of the most relaxed, uh, chill surgeons that I've met. And especially, and the cool thing is we see that reflected in the room too. And I think that's something that's that's really important. I don't know if, if that's from your upbringing or what, but we always notice that there, there, there are always those rooms that no one wants to be in with mm -hmm. surgeons, right? Yeah. And then there's there's the ones where you go in and they're like, oh man, like Dr. Crowther's the nicest guy. And you're kind of the thermostat for the room as opposed to the thermometer. Like if it's, it seems like I've noticed even when maybe the ro there might be like a, a glitch in the robot or anything like that. You calmly assess it and fix the situation as opposed to like right away, just hair on fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's part of my upbringing. Like I'm pretty laid back, um, easygoing, I would say. And, um, yeah, I get frustrated at the times for sure. But, um, you know, I think it, like you say, like you gotta, uh, realize that, you know, people are looking to you, um, and looking at you and how you respond and how you react and, uh, maybe it's the fact that I have five kids and kind of had to learn that, right? You know, when a kid gets hurt, if you're like, oh, wow, you know, are you okay? Are you okay? You know, then it heightens their worry. So uh, maybe that goes into it. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I appreciate, uh, thanks uh, thanks for the comment and uh, compliment. But um, yeah, for me, like, um, I just want to have a relaxed environment. I want to have a team that's happy to be there and, um, you know, makes everyone's day better, makes the outcomes for the patients better. And yeah, things go, things go wrong, but, um, really it's, it's our attitude and how we respond to that, um, is really what the outcome is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so if you were to, to, to kind of leave a, a last note to anyone in Colorado Springs that, has you know any kind of spam, spine pathology or any kind of possible back related injuries? Um, what would you say that you're different for? How how are you? How would you say you differentiate yourself from a lot of the other spine surgeons down in Colorado Springs? Sure. Yeah, I would say that um, you know I'm uh, see you as a person, person, not as a patient, not as a you know a dollar sign or anything like that. Um, that I want to uh, truly understand what your pathology is, what's causing you your issue, find kind of the least invasive, um, most focused approach to treat that. Um, and then, you know, I utilize robotics, uh, utilize kind of the latest and greatest technology to give you the safest, most precise, most accurate outcome um, in surgery. Absolutely. And I can, I can say we, we put, you know, we're building our, our Globot training program, our robotics training program for all of our reps in your OR because of how well you've launched that program. So um, awesome. Well, thanks for coming on today. Uh, always great seeing you. Um, if anyone is in Colorado Springs and has any kind of spine issues, I would 100% send them, send them to Dr. Crowther. Um, and your practice is so uh, practice is uh, Colorado Center of Orthopedic Excellence. Um, have a couple locations there in Colorado Springs and um, operate uh, in Colorado Springs, come up to Denver as well to uh, Sky Ridge and Lone Tree. Um, so yeah, very accessible. Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming on. Thanks and for, yeah, hopefully we see you soon. Thanks for having me and uh, always a pleasure to be in your presence and have you around and uh hopefully we'll get you down to colorado spring sometime we should uh a lot of good things to do down there have to go do the incline or so, have you done the incline high. oh yeah oh yeah that's a i one of the uh one of the reps down there 
um, was a, uh, I, I did my, I was a junior rep down there. I was an ASR okay. down there. That's where I started. Yeah. And uh, Brad Varing was the guy that I was under. So he was a silver medalist in the Olympics okay. in like, back in like 2007 or something like that. And I asked him, I'm like, so out of all the Olympic athletes that ran the incline, who was the best at it? Like who could have the best time? Yeah. What would you guess? Um, well, I think I know this, but um, I mean, I would have thought like a track guy yeah. or long distance runner or Same. something like that. Yeah. That's what I guessed. Yeah. He told yeah. me it was Apollo Ono. Yeah. He's like, that guy crushed the incline, like absolutely destroyed the incline. Yep. And he was like, he's like, he would, he would lap us as yeah. wrestlers. I'm like, oh man, there's it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, powerful legs. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, we'll okay. definitely get down there soon. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for, for having coming me. on. Appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers.